well. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panel. So please come out. Um, their topic um, is the shifting sands in internet governance. And since it's a panel, I think questions will be very important. I've been thinking about it quite a bit. Uh, first of all, I asked myself, uh, Paul, why, uh, why the sands are shifting? <laughs> and then if there's it's sand, does it mean it's impermanent? You know, there's, the things are not the way they should be? And then I got to thinking, I got really scared because somebody's governing the internet and I didn't actually know that. So hopefully they'll tell us that. And finally, of course, the obvious question is, uh, we're talking about technology policy. And what does that really mean? Probably they have much more important questions than these, but I got interested just in the title. Uh, Paul Mitchell is a senior leader here at Microsoft. Uh, he has broad experience in knowledge and, knowledge and policy and standards that I want to personally thank him because we had an idea for what we'd like to do, but really it was Paul's work that pulled together uh, both Mary and Sally who have joined us to do that. Uh, Mary Saunders is a Director of Standards Coordination at uh, NIST, and uh, Sally Wentworth is a Senior Manager of Public Policy at the Internet Society, and they both have broad knowledge and experience and have been thinking about this and talking about this, and I'm sure that you'll really enjoy their technology policy. I haven't actually heard technology policy defined as something that would be enjoyable before, but we'll try to make it interesting. Uh, and I thought that uh, the way to start this off would be to ask Sally to give a little bit of an overview of just exactly how has the internet governance environment worked? Where did all this come from? And what are these shifting sands? So, Sally. Great. Thanks, and, and hello, everyone. I thought maybe I'd just ask um, the audience a little participation here. How many of you have heard of the International Telecommunication Union? Yeah. Good number. <laughs> OK. Um, and were all of you aware that um, in the UN system, there's a topic of discussion called internet governance? OK, a, few, a little bit fewer. So I think this is um, a way to perhaps bring those, those two concepts together. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, the International Telecommunication Union is um, a specialized agency of the United Nations. It has deep historic roots in the international community dating back to the 1800s when it was the International Telegraph Union. So it's been around for a long time and has um, changed its scope and its mandate uh, periodically throughout the years to accommodate um, the changes in technology. Um, they uh, govern themselves on the basis of uh, treaty. It is a treaty-based organization. The treaties of the ITU are signed and ratified by the ITU member states, roughly 193 member states. Um, and so it is uh, a legal organization that does a, a broad range of work in the telecommunications space, including spectrum allocation, uh, satellite issues, radio regulations, telecommunication standards, development work, et cetera. Uh, one of the treaties of the ITU is something called the International Tele Telecommunication Regulations. And I brought a copy because that's what I do. It's a short treaty. Uh, it, it, again, has been around for a long time, um, originating back in the 1800s as a telegraph regulations, um, and has, again, since uh, changed over the years. But it is now the International Telecommunication Regulations, and the treaty was last negotiated in 1988. Um, the international community, uh, a number of years ago, decided that it was time to update this treaty in light of the changing environment in light of perhaps many of the things that many of you in this room are working on, the thinking being that the international treaty structure wasn't sufficient to accommodate the changes in technology. Uh, the treaty itself really does reflect the era in which it was written, 1988. Think about uh, what the communications landscape looked like then, largely telecom monopolies, government, uh, very strong government involvement in the communications marketplace. If you were an end user, you would think high costs to make a telephone call. Uh, and these are um, really reflected in this 1988 treaty in that governments felt like they needed to decide and determine how traffic would move across borders. 
how uh, money would be exchanged, what you would do with things like safety of life communication, priority communications, and the like. Um, and, and that is this treaty. It's actually very short. It's only about 15 pages. It's at a fairly high level of generality. Um, and, and they're going to revise it this year in Dubai. Um, so governments, as we speak, are preparing to negotiate this treaty, make changes to the treaty. And uh, one of the concerns that a number of us have is that the changes that have been proposed would sweep in aspects of uh, the internet architecture, of other um, communications technologies that are currently not encompassed by the treaty. Uh, that could have implications for things like global interoperability, the you know, connectivity prices, um, uh, the architecture, the standards, and a number of the other things that, that perhaps we all take as a given to do the work that we do. So uh, one of the things that I would pose to you is that this is a very important policy event. Uh, this is moving from a level of abstraction, which we've seen in past policy events where we issue declarations, um, statements of principle, and moving into um, treaty text, which will be signed and ratified by member states. Uh, when we look at some of the proposals that have come forward, we see things related to standards. We see re things related to routing of traffic, numbering, internet, uh, perhaps IP addresses cybersecurity, a host of topics that, again, go to fundamental aspects of the architecture that we need to be global, not fragmented, affordable, uh, allow for the free expression of, of ideas, to allow for the movement of data across borders. Um, and I think it's really important, and one of the things that the Internet Society has seen is that it's really important that the technical community get engaged in this discussion. Governments need to hear from you how you use the infrastructure, how much you depend upon it, uh, what things you may want to see changed, what things should not be changed. Um, and, and that voice needs to be heard uh, by governments around the world so that they can make effective decisions at this conference in Dubai. So maybe I'll stop there and, and we can move on. All right, thanks. So Mary, uh, the ITU has been an organization yeah. that has, has been around for well over 100 years and has been instrumental in actually enabling telecommunication services in many countries mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, and as a specialized uh, agency of the United Nations, which of course came after ITU was founded, right. um, which is interesting in and of itself. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the sort of role of standards, yeah. both in enabling te uh, telecommunications generally, and then how we should think about standards going forward relative to the internet okay. and the ITU's role sure. thereof. Yeah, so let me, um, thanks Paul, and let me start. Um, by giving you just a very high-level overview of why NIST is engaged in this set of discussions at all. <laughs> um, so we're the NIST is the National Measurement Institute for the United States. So we have four laboratories, an information technology laboratory. Um, and that laboratory in particular has specific responsibilities for federal government systems with respect to the uh, security of those systems. Um, so rights federal information processing standards as well as I'm sure many of you are familiar with the NIST special publications uh, for um, computer systems and uh, mobile applications most recently. We have an engineering lab, a materials measurement, and a physical measurement lab. About 30% of the NIST technical staff, uh, over 400 individuals, scientists and, and engineers participate in standards development activities in over 120 venues. In all of the, across all of the technology spaces where we do measurement research. A bulk of that, a large amount of that comes out of the Information Technology Laboratory in computer security, in high-speed networks, in accessibility, um, and a whole range of other uh, IT-related areas. Uh, one of those standards venues is ITUT. So ITU, as, as Sally mentioned, is a, is a treaty organization. It has uh, sectors. ITUT is, is the telecommunications, but it's also known as the standardization sector. There's a radio sector and a development sector. Um, ITUT has currently 10 study groups that write 
voluntary standard, technical standards in a, in a variety of different areas, next generation networks, um, uh, cloud computing, there's a whole study group on security. But the ITUT activities, while widely used um, globally, are only one of n number of venues where uh, these technical documents are written. And so NIST has for a long time had staff participating in relevant ITU study groups um, to represent um, both US government interests as well as industry interests, because we work actively with a broad range of the, of, you know, obviously Microsoft and a lot of the other um, uh, providers as well as network uh, carriers and a range of other uh, industry interests. And we, it's called the standards ecosystem related to telecommunications, but more broadly related to information and communication technologies, of which the internet is a component. The internet is an enabler. Uh, it enables, um, obviously, you all to conduct research and to share the results and the uh, intermediate steps in that research. It enables lots of things. Um, and so we, uh, from the NIST perspective, we see it as a tool. And I think as a government agency, we play much more heavily in the, not only in the telecom aspects of standardization and standards we see as infrastructure which enables both the, the hardware to interoperate and conform to specifications as well as the software and all of the services that are layered on top of that, that broad infrastructure. Um, so that's why we have an interest. I think we pay more heavily as an institute in the, in the IT space than we do really in the telecom space. But that puts us in a uh, unique position.